Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, the BRICS, growing economies and increasing political clout. We'll talk about the implications of that next on Global Perspectives. This program is made possible in part by funding from the Lawrence J. and Dora P. Chastang Charitable Foundation, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. Much of the ink and airtime of the chattering classes focus on U.S.-China economic relations, but attention should also be paid to the other so-called BRICS. The rising powers, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, increasingly see themselves as almost a political bloc with similar international economic interests. Relative political and economic stability since the mid-1990s has allowed Brazil to rival India for the number two slot behind China's economy. Although almost energy independent and now an exporter of food, the growth has not helped everyone and has clearly hurt some. Our guest today, Terry McCoy, director of the Latin American Business Environment Program at the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida, can help us sort through some of these issues and perhaps offer some lessons for American businesses. Welcome to the program, Terry. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Tell us about your very first trip to Latin America. <laughs> what, what was it, and was it exciting? Was it dull? Was it dangerous? I actually drove across the U.S.-Mexican border uh, back in the 60s, um, having studied Spanish in Latin America and very concerned about whether I could actually communicate with anybody. So it turned out to be a very exciting trip. I spent uh, summer there studying Spanish, and uh, it, it, I've gone back to Mexico a lot, but that was the first trip, and indeed it was great. So now we're talking about the BRICS, and the key BRIC in terms of Latin America and the Caribbean is Brazil. Yeah. What does this mean in the overall economic conversation? Well, I think it means the emergence of, of Brazil on the global arena. Uh, Brazil's always been, had a kind of inferiority complex. It's not taken seriously. It's always played second fiddle to the United States and the Americas. And in the last 10 years or so, Brazil has finally arrived, as it were. And under the previous president, uh, Lula, uh, he made fun of, he had fun uh, sort of saying that finally Brazil's here and the United States needs to listen to us. And so that's very important. But there's something concrete behind Brazil's emergence. It's more than a public relations play. In fact, it is um, the fact that the Brazilians have sort of gotten their act together politically and economically. There's a famous saying about Brazil, Brazil's the country of the future and always will be. Now Brazil, the future's here for Brazil. And this is sort of a, a recognition of this. What does this mean in terms of opportunities and challenges for various parts of the United States, including Florida? Well, Brazil is Florida's number one trading partner. So it, f what happens in Brazil and what happens with Brazil is very important to Florida. Uh, Brazilians are a major source of tourists in the United States, particularly in central Florida. But Brazil has uh, other ties. There's lots of two-way investment now. It's not only American capital going to Brazil, it's Brazilian capital coming here and here to the, to f the state of Florida. It's kind of solidified a relationship that's uh, very important to the state. And I think most people in the state, most businesses and most political officials are kind of aware of that. There are periodic trade missions that go to Brazil. And certainly if you talk to the, uh, the sort of Fortune 500 companies that are based in the Miami area, they're all, they're all aware of Brazil. Explain to us the love affair that Brazil has had with Florida specifically. This is something a lot of people talk about. Yeah, the, I think it has a lot to do. For, for many Brazilians, Florida is the United States. If you ask somebody if they've been to Brazil, but if you, have they been to the United States, they say uh, yes. And you say where? Well, it's either Miami or Orlando. Uh, there's this whole other country out there, as we know. I think they love the Central Florida uh, amusement uh, parks. They love the fact that there's a kind of Latin culture here and people understand them. I think they also like the fact that they don't speak Spanish and so it's a kind of challenge to people thinking they must speak Spanish. Um, 
And then recently, Florida has become very inexpensive for Brazilians because of the exchange rate. So Brazilians, it's not unusual for Brazilians to fly to uh, either Orlando or Miami and spend a week and buy stuff and take it back and resell it and pay for their trips. So that's part of it. It's part of economic love. Talk to us about the uh, overall business relationship between the United States and, and Brazil. Where, where has it been and where does it appear to be going? And what opportunities might be there for American-based businesses? Well, until recently, uh, Brazil was a pretty closed economy, and so what you found was um, American exports uh, that the Brazilians allowed in, and they excluded a lot, particularly manufactured goods. I remember during the 80s and 90s, you, you couldn't take in computers, for example. Brazil had their own computer industry, which was 10 years behind everybody else and very expensive. Brazil's opened its economy, not completely, but substantially. So now there are trade opportunities that didn't exist before. Brazil has a huge domestic market. Brazil is uh, 200 million people, 200 million plus people. Half of the Brazilian population is in the middle class. What does that mean? They're buying cell phones, they're buying televisions, they're buying cars, they're buying houses, they're buying internet service, and they're traveling. They're coming to the United States, they're coming to Florida. So that's a tremendous opportunity as well. Uh, generally speaking, relations between the United States and Brazil have been pretty friendly. I think Brazilians always resent the fact that we, we don't give them more attention. But in the meantime, they've go, gone off on their own and, and are doing quite well without our attention. Well, you often hear complaints from Latin America and the Caribbean in general that we don't pay enough yeah. attention unless there's a crisis yeah. in, in a given country. And that has been a big part of the history of U.S. relations with that region. It's ironic because it's a peace, generally a very peaceful re uh, region. The one serious problem they have with violence is drug-related violence, and that is linked to the United States in, in terms of consuming the drugs and money laundering and weapons. Um, I think in general Latin America today has emerged on the global scene independent of, independent of the United States. Uh, even those countries which are close nominally to the United States like, Le Com like Colombia and Mexico and, and Chile still are pretty independent more so than they would have been not so long. I see this as a very healthy trend. The emergence of China as a major economic partner with Latin America has given Latin America options. Uh, they trade with each other more than they used to. So Latin America is, 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 is more mature, let's say, than it, than it has been until quite recently. That, that sort of takes us in a slightly different direction when you talk about uh, business relationships between the BRIC countries. How, yeah. how much of that is more and more part of the global scene? You know, BRICS as an economic block don't exist. BRICS as a political block which you mentioned is sort of beginning to emerge but it doesn't constitute a force yet. In its meeting earlier this year the BRIC countries in South Africa agreed to set up an investment bank. They agreed to, ha to do several other things. The relationship that's most important, let's take Brazil now, is with China. China is Brazil's leading trading partner. Ch China is a major source of investment in Brazil. China China, cheap Chinese imports are a threat to Brazilian manufacturers. So, Bra so Brazil and China have this relationship which is quite significant. Brazil does a minor amount of trade with India and Russia, not much, but that might be developing as well. Where do you think the relationship between the United States and Brazil and between the United States and the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean could go over the next five to ten years. Do you see it expanding significantly in the in the economic realm? Well, I think Latin America is the United States overall the United States' most important economic uh, partner. If you look at all dimensions in this, uh, more important uh, than much bigger countries, much more developed, rich countries. Uh, and so I think that will continue to benefit us over the last, um, well, beginning in 1994, we began to sign trade agreements. The first was NAFTA, Central American Free Trade Agreement, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Panama. Now we all have. So there's that. 
Then there is this emergence of the Pacific Basin, Basin countries, and we tend to think of us, of them as Canada, the United States, and the Asian countries, but it's Canada, the United States, Mexico, and all the South American countries. So that's another emerging, interesting economic entity that may redefine uh, our relations with Latin America. Perhaps it'll become closer to the Pacific coast, the Atlantic coast. You, you made reference to the illegal drug trade and there are other tensions in the relationship between yeah. the United States and Latin America and the Caribbean. To what extent do those counter the progress that's being made on the economic front? Are yeah. they just an inevitability? Well, can you we know, ever fix them? You know, it's a good them? question. Um, most of that's focused on U.S. and Mexico, but, but now the trouble spot is Central America. The drug traffickers and the whole drug industry is very adept at uh, changing to fit uh, security measures taken by the United States and other countries. So what used to come by ship or small plane from Colombia to the islands to Florida now comes up through Central America. And, and the Central American states are pretty weak states. That is, the, uh, Costa Rica doesn't even have an army. And those uh, nations that do are, are no match uh, for the drug traffickers who are well armed and have infinite resources. Uh, and so that's a serious concern, thinking of Honduras, Guatemala, Salvador particularly, and now even Costa Rica is threatened by this. I think these countries absolutely need the help of the United States and the other importing countries, the other consuming countries, those would be in Europe. Unfortunately, us, there are a lot of drug consumption now in South America, and a lot of drugs now, the drug industry is centered in Colombia, <laughs> the production of cocaine. Now a lot of it's shipped out through South America, and it's, it's become a problem with armed gangs in the slums of Rio de Janeiro and even on the streets of Buenos Aires. So it's a more, a, a, it's a more hemispheric problem than it used to be. And it does, as you said, because of the profits involved, have a logic of its own. A number of, South, of Latin American statesmen have begun to suggest recently that we ought to consider decriminalization, at least of marijuana. And then they took notice of the elections last fall in some U.S. states that have done that in effect and said, listen, you're telling us we've got to crack down and you're not. I think that we, we need to work with them to explore other options. I think there's a widespread belief, which I believe is probably accurate, that the, the so-called war against drugs is not working. And second, they're the ones who have paid the price in terms of blood uh, and uh, violence. And so uh, with that in mind, we as consumers and a uh, source of money laundering and weapons need to take this more seriously. Let's go back to the broader discussion about the, the BRICS. There are some people in the United States who see them as a challenge to U.S. economic leadership, maybe U.S. leadership overall. How, how do you see them? Is this a natural development of a changing uh, international system yeah. where a bigger piece of the pie is yeah. going to other places, or is there something else going on? Well, let's use the pie analogy or metaphor. Is the bigger piece of the pie going to someplace else? Yes, they're getting a larger piece of the pie. But because of that, the pie is growing, okay? So the pie is much bigger now. And, you know, we used to think the United States for decades after World War II gave development assistance. Well, they're finally developing, which is presumably what we wanted to see. I think it's a very healthy uh, development, and I'm hoping that uh, the United States uh, political classes will begin to see it that way. Certainly business is seeing it that way. And is it just, you said that they have some of the makings of a political block and the economic yeah. block concept is way down the road if it's there at all, but uh, what do you think the intentions are, what appear to be the intentions of, of the individual BRIC countries? Do you think they are aiming for uh, superpower status, uh, global influence, or are they simply rising uh, through the system and, and taking their share? I think they're aiming for a voice and for influence and for superpower status, but the power is soft power. Uh, they've made, and certainly the Brazilians have been very clear about this, and I think the, most of the other superpowers have the other ones. You know, China is not so clear in this regard. 
but they see themselves not in terms of building a military might the way superpower status has been achieved in the past, but building economic might, giving, uh, getting voice in international debates and forums. Uh, there's now the G20, it used to be the G8, okay? And they're setting international trade policies. That's, you know, from Latin America, that's Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico. In the United Nations, push now by Brazil and India to have security, permanent security uh, uh, council status. I think that's all re uh, legitimate and appropriate. I can remember 20 years ago or so, uh, imagining somebody saying, imagine U.S. policy if we treated Brazil the way we treat Great Britain or France or Germany. And that's, I think that's a reasonable thing to aspire to, and I think that's what they want. If you do expand the permanent group of the UN Security Council, how, how do you choose? Because there's yeah. more than one contender in Latin America and, and the well, Caribbean. Brazil, there's more than one Brazil's contender in Africa. Power, okay? It's there's going to be competition. There's no doubt about that. And I don't pretend to understand the other uh, regions of the world. And Brazil, I think Brazil makes the logical candidate, but there would be other countries that might suggest them, and they might act against them. Uh, I I don't know, but. It doesn't make any sense to have a Security Council. It didn't make any sense to have a Security Council without China, the real China. It doesn't make any sense to have Security Council without these other important new players and things, these emerging markets that are now more than emerging markets. They're emerging players. You used to, the way used to, international relations theorists used to talk about Latin America is that it was not a, re, a rule giver internationally. It was a rule taker. I think they're now giving rules. It's two countries, basically. It's Brazil and it's, our, and it's Venezuela. And the Venezuelan, if we have to pick which we want, it's obviously going to be Brazil. Venezuela is, is much more troubling. And in spite of uh, you know, the sense that there's no way this Chavez person can become influential, he became influential. And you know, I don't know what that means in the future, but I think certainly Brazil's not going to go away. And I think Mexico's also going to be more of a player. Argentina would like to be. Uh, Argentina is a more troubling uh, scenario right now. So uh, I think these are good. To go back to your original question, I think this is a healthy development. Where do you see the political systems in the region going? There was a period of time in yeah. which democracy was scarce, and then democracy yeah. became prevalent. and and now we've had a movement into other directions, a re-embracing yeah. of socialism in various countries. Where do you think all of this is going to end up? Well, I think there's a, a set of countries, the majority of countries, um, that uh, representative constitutional democracy is the current arrangement and, the, and, and it's likely to be the future arrangement. I don't think there's likely to be. What you, what you would fear in Latin America say at the end of the 80s and end of the 90s was uh, a resurgence of the military. That, that has not happened. And um, the outliers are these countries led by Venezuela, which have not, well, they have democratically elected governments, but the same people never leave power. And they accumulate power at the expense of the legislative branches and the judicial branches in civil society, basically, and that's troubling. It's a kind of, a, it's a kind of a democratic authoritarianism or constitutional authoritarianism. So what's a little bit troubling for U.S. policymakers and people like me is that the rest of the Latin American nations don't stand up to that and hold them to the, uh, the norms of normal democracy, no, normal democratic government. Don't criticize them as much as would be expected. So why is that? And is there anything that could be done you know, to I change it? I think it has to do with this long-term fear of Latin America from outside intervention. And that outside intervener historically has been the United States. So they are very reluctant to criticize their own neighbors on it's just something that's not generally done. Somebody pointed out in a column I read last spring that who went to the funeral of Hugo Chavez? All of the presidents of Latin America were there, all of them, even those that presumably weren't very friendly with him. 
And that was a statement of solidarity with Venezuela. It was a statement of independence from the United States to a certain extent. And I think that's probably what we're going to see in the future. You've been traveling to Latin America and the Caribbean more than most. <laughs> what, what? And obviously there are you know, unique situations country to country. But what do you think continues to be the biggest misperception that Latin Americans have about the United States and the biggest misperception that Americans have about Latin America? Well, Latin Americans know the United States much better than U.S. citizens know Latin America. They're familiar through television and movies and, and magazines and media, and then lots of them travel here, okay? And many of them have relatives and friends here, so they know us quite well, basically. Uh, I would say for those in that group of people, the majority, there are a lot of serious misperceptions. I think for uh, U.S. perceptions of Latin America, misperceptions of Latin America would say that it's kind of backwards, it's dangerous, uh, and it's, uh, it's kind of messy and not well governed, those kinds of things. And I think that those are misperceptions by and large. Clearly there are parts of Latin America that are dangerous, as there are in any country. But generally, Latin America is a pretty peaceful place, actually. So, you know, I hope we're going closer together, and it may be that the, um, the people are going, going closer together, converging, as it were, more faster than the governments are. We're certainly converging on the economic front. Your Latin American Business Environment Report yes. has become widely read. Uh, how has work on that particular project uh, affected you and your perspectives regarding the region? What I've done is every year I kind of focus on the year and countries and all of a sudden now, almost 20 years later, I wake up and say, hey, listen, this place has changed dramatically. <laughs> McCoy, take yourself seriously. <laughs> and so I've gone back and looked at it and, and I am impressed by the changes. And I think the real changes, they are real and I think they're lasting. So Latin America is not going to fall back. There was a history of rise and fall of economics and politics. I don't think that's going to happen again. There are these populous, these countries with populous governments. That, that is sort of a mystery to me, how that's going to work itself out. But the rest of the region seems on a pretty solid path and on a, a lot of different ways. And, and one of the important ways is this emergence of a middle class. Latin America now, or many countries, is predominantly a middle class societies. When I first started in Latin America, there was no middle class. At least that was the popular uh, portrayal of Latin America. There was kind of a rich elite up here and then the vast majority down at the bottom. But now there's this large middle class that look more or less like our middle class. You and I have been talking about Latin America and the Caribbean for, for many years and I've especially enjoyed some of the anecdotes that don't necessarily make their <laughs> way in, into interviews. Is there ever going to be a sort of a McCoy tell-all book that, that includes these anecdotes <laughs> and, and gives us an interesting insight into another yeah. aspect of life in Latin America and the Caribbean. You know the Woody Allen movie Zelig where he was a uh, kind of witness to all of the things that went on in, in the movie. They have them sort of, I've been through a lot of those. I've, I've had the opportunity of meeting lots of presidents and public officials and kind of being witness to things. I've, I actually went to Cuba in 1992. I wanted to get down there before the communism fell. And I was invited uh, by the Academy of Sciences. And I thought, well, I'm going to go. You know, Who knows when this will end? And I actually w went to a speech by Fidel Castro, for example. I went to Guyana about the same time on behalf of the US government and the uh, embassy to give a talk about democratization in Latin America. And, and Teddy Jagan, the famous leader of, the, of, of Guyana, who the United States had pushed out of power under the Kennedy administration, came to my talk and asked me, well, Dr. McCoy, when are they going to pay attention to us? And I got to know him well. And so I've had some really great opportunities, and I enjoy um, reliving them, at least in my mind. I'm not sure how much other people are interested in it. Certainly, my family has heard us a lot. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. McCoy. Thanks, John. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Garcia, and we'll see you next time.
This program is made possible in part by funding from the Lawrence J. and Dora P. Chastang Charitable Foundation, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center.